podcast, a special with Sunny Shade. Uh, today we're talking about domestic violence. And on the show, what we're hoping to do is provide you with as much information and as help as you need. Last year, during the first national lockdown, the government launched a campaign. It's hashtag you are not alone. And it's to provide support to domestic, advi- to domestic abuse victims, but also their families. We're joined now by Sadish Pal, who is the executive director of SWAN, which is a Sikh women's action network. Sadish, thank you you for joining us thank um, you very much today i guess the first question is a lot of people get really confused when you try to get an understanding of domestic violence domestic abuse so can you tell us what is domestic abuse right so there is a government definition of domestic abuse so it's recognized as being um power and control it's about coercive control and it includes all those different types of tactics that people use when they inflict domestic abuse, things like physical violence, sexual abuse, emotional, psychological abuse and financial abuse. But also sometimes people don't understand, they think that, oh, it's only about partners and husbands and wives, but actually it can include uh, the wider community and your extended family as well. Mm -hmm. So it's also recognized because of FGM, female genital mutilation, honor-based violence, forced marriage, which is all inflicted normally by your uh, immediate or extended family. And when we look at um, domestic abuse, some, one of the conversations that um, sometimes get lost when we are having these discussions is the male perspective in the sense of people uh, who might not feel confident coming forward being their gender. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the issues that I have around uh, having these conversations where men are sort of ignored or if not, it, it, they're not given that voice in this uh, sort of space. Hmm. Um, what, what is the government doing and what is, uh, you know, um, some of the help out there for men who in in their position, who may be feeling, uh, maybe you know, in this situation, what you just highlighted, yeah. but aren't competent to come forward because they're a man, and yeah. that was a simple basis. Oh, yeah. you got beaten up by your wife, yeah. by your your partner, yeah. or you know. How do they get the confidence to come forward and talk about yeah. this? Yeah, so there is a big movement in supporting men, male victims of domestic abuse. And even the government is recognising this. And so they have even put funding aside right here and right now while they're talking about the domestic abuse bill, yeah. which is a massive movement from the government perspective that they've identified um, lots of different issues and concerns. And this bill is having hundreds of amendments made to it because it started out as being quite simple, I would say. But as organisations and more and more organizations are getting involved they're talking about the different issues including male domestic abuse so the funding that the government are putting aside um for the UK to be fund to fund services are also prioritizing and putting a specific amount of money aside specifically for male domestic abuse victims and I'm aware of a number of charities out there who are doing this work um, we know domestic abuse is a gendered issue, it is mainly female victims yeah. and male perpetrators, but we know when it gets to court, those those figures skew a little bit more because around sort of 15 plus percent of victims in those that are going to court are also male victims. Mm. And that's not necessarily saying they're female perpetrators, no. they're also in... Uh, homosexual relationships so it could be male or male abuse as well and we know that in honour-based violence and forced marriage situations men can also be again according to the forced marriage unit 15% to 20% of those cases are male victims so, so lots happening. With that in mind I mean last year it was you know one of the hardest years for so many different people because of the coronavirus pandemic the first lockdown hit and it really made life hard for everyone being told that you couldn't leave your home, but especially so um, for people who were in abusive relationships. And that's why the government launched the uh, You Are Not Alone campaign. Delve into and tell us a little bit more about what this actually means, because people are being asked to hashtag You Are Not Alone on Mm. social media to raise awareness about this. Really, what does this come down to with You Are Not Alone in the campaign? Yeah, so this campaign came off the back of all of this information from things like the National Domestic Violence Helpline, Um, We know that statistically two women are murdered every single week in this country, which Mm -hmm. is really, really sad. But in the first three weeks of lockdown in April or in March, I should say, when it started, that first three weeks of lockdown saw 14 people die. That was mainly women, but some children as well. So that that statistic where it should have been six women in that time, which should be none, but, you know, statistically should have been six. There were 14 people who died. So it doubled. More than doubled. Yeah. And this is why the government um, decided to launch this campaign. And following this, they've launched like the Annie project as well, where somebody can go into um, 
a, a chemist or a super drug, wherever, they can go to one of those places and ask for any. Um, and that's like for immediate help. They, anybody who knows, if, if you go in and ask the pharmacist for any, they know somebody needs help. There were also initiatives like uh, Rail to Refuge, which I, in my other life, also run refuge provision, mm -hmm. and we've used it. So where victims can't get to us because they've got no money, mm -hmm. we can use this um, uh, online website. We put in an application. They give us a code. We can purchase a, a, a rail ticket for a woman or a family to get to wherever they, the destination they need to get to, to a refuge uh, at no cost to them. Mm. So there's lots of different initiatives that they've put into place just to show victims that they are not alone. Mm -hmm. Because we know that people during lockdown, before lockdown, there was some respite yes. because, you know, people going off to work and, you know, again, there's extended family abuse and things like that. But once lockdown happened, people were finding themselves locked in their homes with perpetrators. It's amplified, right? Everything's amplified. And multiple perpetrators. You've got children in the home as well because mm -hmm. they're not at school. So they're experiencing or witnessing abuse. So this was on the back of all of these different things that were being recognised, which is great from the government perspective that they recognise this. Mm. And um, is there any other kind of help when people haven't got access to, say, going out? Maybe they're just stuck at home. Is it a phone yeah. uh, number that they can use? Is it a text message they can send yeah. to receive some kind of help? Because when you talk about control, that's one of the things. They take away everything, don't they? Your yeah. financial support and everything, they, they, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah. So is there anything that anyone who's listening right now thinking... I recognise everything you're saying, mm. but I'm not in a situation where I can even walk out the house right now. Yeah. So most of the sort of big domestic abuse um, services like Refuge or Women's Aid, their websites have got um, a chat chat uh, functions so you can talk to somebody privately on chat they've got a one click button on there so if you need to quickly shut down okay. and you press that button it wipes your history Brilliant. on your on your uh, computer or on your phone so if somebody came and checked to see what is it that you're looking at they there would be no history of it okay. so the the sites are set up that way uh -huh. um so yeah so there's there's all of that and you know we're part of uh, a um domestic abuse honor based violence forced marriage helpline so people can phone us. It's a 24-hour helpline. So if it's only in the middle of the night that you think you can get away and do that, you can phone us and talk to us. What's the number? So the number is 0800 if I get it right. No, it's... Oh, oh I've got the number. Is that the oh, number? That, yeah, yeah, that's the number, yeah. So it's, sorry, so it's 0800 953 There you go, 9777. Yeah. And uh, what if there was a yeah. language barrier in between them yeah. communicating? And yeah. we, we talk about domestic violence, but obviously people who might be more vulnerable waiting mm. for the immigration status for example yeah. uh, so if someone's in a situation thinking if I say anything they're going to send me back home yeah. or I'm going to be so there's there's all these different uh, situations that people could be in yeah. when we are talking on the, in this platform yeah. that might be thinking I can't relate to that yeah. because I'm in this situation yeah. how do we safeguard those individuals yeah. so number one the helpline has got staff who speak different languages so they speak Punjabi Hindi Urdu and we've got access to people who can speak wider languages as well so Bangladeshi Bengali mm -hmm. Gujarati and so on. Um, secondly, I would what I would say is that there is support for victims who have got uh, who have got no status in this country if they've come over on a spousal visa. So often it's women who are married and actually men as well. As men, yeah. yeah, who are married into a, a home here. They are here on a spousal visa. There is what they call under the immigration rule the domestic violence concession, and this means that if you make an application to the Home Office based on domestic abuse, and you need some level of evidence, so you need services like ours involved. They might they might ask for police evidence, so the police might have need to have been called at some point, or you might have a GP evidence because right. you've been to CGP. Long as you've got some evidence, an application can go in this is uh, uh, available under legal aid mm -hmm. and it's like a fast track system so as soon as your application goes in you're entitled to benefits which means then you can access refuge and you can access everything like anybody else so support is there if you're worried about being thrown back you're being threatened yeah. that you're going to be taken back we can support still you know there is there is no worries around that issue the government have put measures in place where victims who have no rec what we call no recourse to public funds because mm. often they're the ones that struggle to get services because they're not entitled to benefits um, but this is this system helps a lot plus there are refugees that even before you put your application in they will accept uh, women who have got no money nothing they will take the hit as to say you know on on the rent and things like that because at the end of the day refugees are 
um, places that, where Rentier comes in and that's what helps run them. Yeah. Mm. But there are specialist services out there who will support these victims and we can put them in touch with those okay. people. Okay, that's a lot of information. Yes. So, so to, to in basic terms, for yeah. anyone who's watching this, because obviously what we need to put into context is if somebody's come here mm. and they are going through immigration status, they may not perhaps, you know, speak to the level of English that you and I do. Mm. So in basic terms, what you're saying is if somebody is threatening you and you're married and you're on their spousal visa yes. and you are a victim of dom domestic abuse, yes. as long as you have evidence, yes. you can get support to stay here. Yeah. You're not going to be shipped out or flown out on the next plane. No, no. So let's give a couple of contact details for anyone who's watching that right now before yeah. we go to a break because that's really important when it comes to this campaign yeah. is to get that information yeah. out there so if you do need help uh there are many organizations that can provide that help to you including karma nirvana the sharon project swan network as well alongside that there are a couple of contact numbers uh which you can call for help firstly it's 0800 953 9777 they're a 24 hour helpline and they do also provide um different languages language interpreters if you need that. We also have the free phone 24-hour National Domestic Abuse Helpline. They too give you any kind of interpreters, whether it's Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi and so on. And their contact number is 0808 2000 247. So that's 0808 2000 247. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Brit Asia podcast, a special with Sunny and Shay, but as you can see, it's just myself now. And that's because this podcast today that we're talking about, the subject matter is a really important one. We're discussing domestic abuse and the government's campaign of hashtag you are not alone. But right now in the last part of our chat, I wanted to focus on talking about women and specifically the South Asian community, because this is a discussion that we do not have a lot about when it comes to this topic. We're joined by by Sadish Pal. She is the executive director of SWAN. Sadish, thanks for, for staying with us. Okay. Um, how important do you think it is that we aim this conversation um, specifically to South Asian women? And I talk about this because you're here with Brit Asia, and of course, we have a predominantly South Asian uh, community viewership mm. and listenership as well. Yeah. Um, there are different cultural nuances, aren't there, when it comes to the South Asian community and women within the South Asian community? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's happened is over the last 10 years, what we've seen, because I've been in this industry now for 25 odd years, that there used to be a lot of um, community organisations aimed at women from the South Asian or the BAME as such mm. uh, communities. And over time, they've slowly, slowly disappeared because local authorities have decided to fund um much fewer organisations. That means right. that the bigger ones have been funded and smaller ones have lost out. And so okay. if they haven't been able to claim uh, grants and things like that, so they've had to close, unfortunately. Mm. But I think over these last few years, again, we've seen a resurgence of community organisations, even if they're voluntary, because I think what's happened is that women like us who are from the community and we deliver what we call a buy and for service. So it's, a, it's a, an organisation, a service run by women for women okay. in our community. So, um, you know, they they trust us and we they know who we are. We're from the community. They're happy to come to us. Whereas where there was a lot of the bigger, larger organisations, they maybe didn't feel confident mm -hmm. going to them. Some women will have experienced racism or a lack of understanding about their issues and things like forced marriage where people say, well, how can anybody force you to get married? Right. And not understanding how uh, uh, violence or emotional um, sort of... Uh, blackmail things like that play out mm. in those situations and so I think it's so important now for these organizations to be reaching out to women and we we saw last year during lockdown um, that in in August we did uh, we looked at our data and um, of the people reaching out to us and we'd found we did a sort of an equation of uh, May June July and we'd seen that we had a 244 percent increase in people wow. reaching out to us compared to the year before the same time okay so we saw like 
children had gone back to school and those teachers were contacting us. People were phoning us for help. People were emailing for their friends and family members and they knew something was wrong. Um, so it's so important for people to reach out. And I think from, from our perspective, because we're the Sikh Women's Action Network, we've seen a real rise in Sikh women coming forward. Okay. And that was why we set up. You know, yeah. we, There are a few organisations out there targeting Asian women, but even when you look at Asian women, there's um, differences in those as well, aren't yeah. there? Yeah, different, uh, um, different cultures. cultures Cultures, religions your faith all the rest of it yeah and um so yeah so when we set up we wanted to target the Sikh community although we don't exclude so we will work with all communities we found that 80 percent of our clientele were from the Sikh community and because they felt comfortable in reaching out and that's why it's important otherwise we know that south asian women will experience around 11 years of abuse before they reach out and for many of them um, a vast majority of them they will experience daily weekly abuse right. um, and so imagine living with that i mean i have to say i spent an evening yesterday with somebody who mm. uh, had attempted suicide and um, she's has been in her marriage for 20 plus years and it's the first time her her family had inkling of what might be going on but didn't know the extent of it okay. until she attempted suicide and that's when it's all come out so that's a long time to yeah. be dealing with the, that sort of situation that can drive you to that point where you're willing to give it all up I mean the lockdown changed our lives in so many <clears throat> different ways mm. and 2020 is going to be remembered as the year of COVID you know there's no, yeah. there's no denying that but when you look at the statistics and why the government have set up this campaign of mm. you are not alone, mm. it's really shocking. Yeah. Um, an estimated 7.3% of women, so that's 1.6 million women across the country, yeah. face uh, domestic abuse. Uh, it's actually half of that when you look at men. So it's 3.6% of men, but that's yeah. just as staggering, isn't it? 750,000 men yeah. experienced domestic abuse in the last year. But what was really interesting, when you look at the Helpline website, Refuge said that they saw a 700% increase in the number of visits to their website. Mm. And it all holds information on domestic abuse. Mm. So the fact of the matter is, anyone who's watching or listening to this right now mm. is either experiencing domestic abuse or knows somebody that is. Absolutely. It's no longer just, a, oh, perhaps hmm. this is a real situation that we all should be dealing with and talking yeah. about I just wonder what's your perspective on that because yeah. I suspect a lot of people will say well it's not happened to me yeah. I don't know about it but yeah. these these statistics are so staggering hmm. we must know somebody who's going through this yeah. I think um uh, if people say that they don't I think either they don't recognize it okay. um or um they're just not being true to themselves I think yeah. I mean it's a case it, it is a situation where you know especially in the South Asian community I would say you know what when you talk to um uh, sort of generic organizations domestic abuse organizations they, they say what happens behind closed doors you know we don't know what's going on mm. I think and I believe in the Asian community the South Asian community we know everything that's going on. And it's like the most open secret that everybody knows about. Right. Everybody knows a relative who does this to their daughter-in-law or a, a husband who does it to the wife. Everybody knows, but nobody speaks up. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue here. It's not It's not behind closed doors. You will watch any of those um, shows on, a, you know, the Asian channels or stuff. Mm. There's so much domestic abuse in that, but it's very glamorized and, 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 and so on. But people might not recognize it and say oh that's domestic abuse so, but uh, when, when you hear domestic abuse yes. i mean before the phrase used to be domestic violence yes. right but the, yeah. the key aspect and the key reason that we use domestic abuse and that definition yeah. is because as you said earlier on sadish it's not just physical violence this can also be control over your life yeah. control over your children's life yeah. it, it can be emotional abuse as well yeah. do you think that's part of the aspect here yeah. is is actually sometimes we don't identify that what's going on yeah. is abuse because it's not physical yes exactly and and we get it when we, we have lots of women talking together they will challenge each other right. victims will say well no what you experience isn't a, a domestic abuse because you weren't hit Mm. But actually, emotional and psychological abuse, coercive control, it's so, um, it breaks women down so severely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that they, that to a point where they can't even breathe. I mean, with physical violence, as bad as it is, it's like it happens and then it's over with. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of, women expect it to mm -hmm. happen. And then they know there's almost like a honeymoon period, like it quietens down Before it until happens, yeah. the tension starts building up again. 
with emotional and psychological abuse, um, it's there all the time and, and it plays with somebody's mind. And gaslighting, which is a new term that mm -hmm. a lot of people started talking about now, um, is something that happens in many, many of these relationships, but people don't realise. Define know. that, because I because yeah. I, I think you're right. We, we, we throw these terms out so yeah. much, yeah. right? And a big part of why we're doing this podcast yeah. is to kind of just simplify it and explain it for people who just, yeah. you know, we, we just wouldn't know about it. So mm. we've heard of terms like, this triggers me, you yeah. know, when, when you've been through a situation it happens again and it will trigger your mind mm. and take you back to that yeah. negative space yeah. but what in your perspective if we're talking about domestic abuse mm. and we, we're using that term gaslighting yeah. can you either give us a scenario or can you just give us a definition and understanding of what that actually means yeah so gaslighting is when somebody makes you believe that their behavior is because of you mm -hmm. so you've made me behave like this or do this so I'm treating you this way because it's your fault. You mm -hmm. spoke like that. You didn't speak to my mum properly or you were rude to this person. That's why I'm doing this to you. That's why I got angry. That's why I lashed out. Mm -hmm. That's what that's about. And and the term gaslighting actually comes from a movie mm. which was set back in the 1940s. It's a mm. black and white film. Yeah, and it which was called Gaslight. Well. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's it. So it started from the movie and then obviously they've done the plays and things afterwards. It was about a man who married this woman for her money and he would do things like hide her jewellery and he'd say to her that you know she she knew she'd put it somewhere and he'd be like no you didn't I didn't see you do that and and then he'd say well check your handbag is it in there could it be in there and she'd check and it'd be in there and she'd be like oh my god I can't I put it in here and I didn't realize I did it so he was doing things but making her think that she was doing she was to blame behind it but it was really him that was mm. doing it so that's where the terminology comes from and it happens a lot and, and you know when we watch programs some of these young reality shows as we love love island and, mm. and things like there's a lot of it in there but people don't necessarily see it mm -hmm. young people are watching these shows and seeing these really good looking glamorous people and they're learning about relationships from these shows right. which i think is really really worrying because there is gaslighting there is abuse there is some psychological game playing going on and it's seen as a fun and like i said glamorous thing and uh, uh but if they're learning about relationships from this this is why later on they find it acceptable mm -hmm. because it's very normalized um, so it's really quite frightening, I think, what's happening right now. Look, stay with us. There's a lot to digest in terms yeah. of what you're talking about. But I also want to take a moment to give you the details if you're watching this. And, and perhaps <clears throat> this is, you know, highlighting things that are happening in your life or someone that you know. And it's think, you're making you think you need help. Or you just might even want to talk to somebody. It could be as simple as that. There are a couple of helplines uh, that you'll need that you can contact 24 hours. One of them, uh, as Sadish mentioned earlier on, was from Swan. Their contact number is 0800 953 9777. Uh, the free 24 hour national domestic abuse helpline run by Refuge is 0808 2000 247. So that's 0808 2247. And it's important to say that these hotlines actually also will provide interpreters. So if you speak in Urdu, Punjabi, Hindi, Bangladeshi, whatever your language is, you can ask for that help. And if you're not sure uh, and maybe thinking, no, this isn't for me, but you just want to ask the question and ask for help, it's still worth contacting them. Uh, if you'd like further details as well, there are organize out, organizations out there like Swan, Kama Nirvana, Sharon Project, Saheli, and that also do provide support as well. We'll be back straight after the break. Welcome to Brit Asia podcast special with Sunny and Shay. And today our topic of focus and what we're discussing is the government campaign, hashtag you are not alone. We're trying to raise as much awareness as we can on domestic abuse. In fact, there's been quite an increase and in rise since the coronavirus pandemic. And we've been having a chat today with Sadish Pal. She is the executive director of SWAN. Sadish, something I did want to talk to you about um, was really around why you believe it's so important for communities Communities to speak out about these issues around domestic abuse. Uh, we're talking about, we're focusing on the South Asian community. We know we're, we're one of the communities really that is known for kind of brushing everything under the carpet. Yeah. In your perspective, why is it important that we really 
shout about this yeah. and discuss something that is happening to a lot of people? I think, I mean, we know that domestic abuse is a human rights violation. And I think we all should be standing up against this. Um, women need to seek help. The impact of domestic abuse is horrific. I mean, we know Asian women are two to three times more likely to attempt to take their own life um, than the general population. We know that they are remaining in these abusive situations for much longer. And, and not only does it have an impact on them, it also has an impact on their children mm. um, and um, the children's future prospects. And, you know, all of this, often women will say, well, the reason I didn't leave was because I thought, for, for my kids, it's important for them to have both parents. Actually, it's more detrimental for a child to have an abusive parent than to have one parent. Let's talk about that. Let's yeah. focus on children. We've talked quite extensively about women. And, and, you know, it's important to say, and I know you did mention this earlier on, that domestic abuse, you know, faces all genders, male and female. Mm -hmm. And it also, alongside that, you know, is faced by the LGBTQ community, the transsexual community as well. And this is something that, you know, we'd probably need days to, to really delve into. Yeah. But, I mean, even the, the, the statistics are, are really shocking, I think a lot of people don't know. 50% of the men who called the Mankind Initiative Helpline mm -hmm. have never spoken to anybody about the abuse that they are suffering. Mm -hmm. And in fact, 71% of those men would not have called the helpline if it wasn't anonymous. So that kind of shows what yeah. is going through the minds of, of a lot of men. But yeah. then if you focus, I mean, if, let's focus on that for a moment, then we'll talk about children. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we could be doing more within our communities for, for men yeah. uh, who haven't had that chance to talk? Yeah, I think I think we can. And I think the issue here is, I think, I mean, we hear about the big headline news stories about mm -hmm. male domestic abuse. And often the ones that get, get airtime are those that have had a lot of physical violence involved. Um, and I think, but a majority of domestic abuse, male domestic abuse cases are, is uh, um, emotional, psychological, because um, women tend to use more emotional, psychological mm -hmm. abuse rather than physical violence. And that's a lot to do with biology uh, and so on. So, because men are obviously stronger. So uh, often women will use those types of tactics to break men down. And so men may not have the physical evidence to 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 prove that what's happening to them is is um, you know they're being belittled or they're being controlled or um, she's deciding on if he can go out with his friends to go and watch football or, or whatever it is or go out for a drink you know to the pub with their mates and things like that and and maybe they trivialise some of that um, but at the same time they feel like that they can't make a decision without. Um, can't make a decision without um, asking their partner or whatever it is. And maybe it's normalised, you know, that these things happen. Or they think people aren't going to believe them. How how would anybody believe that a six-foot-something man is mm -hmm. being uh, abused by his girlfriend who might be, you know, five foot tall mm. or whatever it is? There's all of these sort of stereotypes. Right. And, and that whole thing about our community, especially our community, but generally with men, man up. You know that thing about manning up, you know, stick up for yourself. Right. Things like that. That, again, is something, again, a very uh, a stereotype this, which is practiced over and over again. And it happens when children, you know, if a, if, a, if a little boy gets into a fight at school and is crying, dad will say, you know, man mm. up. But if it's a girl, come and sit on my lap, come here, here, there, there, you know, it's fine. Mm, it's so I think it's that we start genderizing and stereotyping children from a really young age. And when men don't, act in that way maybe they feel like there's something not quite right or that you know they, they feel afraid of of being judged so the fact that they can call these um helplines anonymously is great because you know i mean it's the same thing as why childline works it's why many of the helplines work our helpline if you want to call us and and not give us your name and you just want yeah. advice or you want to make your name up, absolutely fine we do not need to know if that's all it is um, and hence why it's so important now to be providing the right support to children as well and making sure their voices are heard. So we're not only working with the adult victim, mm. we're also working with children in their own right in a really safe and child-friendly way to try and help them deal with what's happened. What does that mean? Because a, a child may be suffering at home, mm. but the, their suffering from a perpetrator is, you know, it's so hard, but it's the person that they still love, Yeah. right? So it could be mum or dad, or mm. it could be um, a, a sibling. Is it important for us to say that if a child is reaching out for help, it doesn't mean that you're going to be ripped apart from the family, that that support is there to ensure 
that you can be helped, yeah. but that also the family can be. Because I guess a lot of why children specifically don't come forward is the fear that yeah. they're going to be taken away from their, yeah. from all that they've known. Yeah. I think that's a really complicated question because, um, yes, we would do everything we can to support the child within the family. Um, but it's really important to stress that where domestic abuse is a situation, things like mediation and trying to do family networking mm. um, in a domestic abuse situation is very, very difficult. Now, where children are um, are being abused directly, there is always a risk that if the child isn't made safe in that environment, that you know social services could step in. So mm. there's always that risk. So I can't sit here and say a child would never be removed. However, like, you know, if... If a child presents at school, often agencies like ours will be called. We will we will step in. We will pro- try and provide support. We will talk to the the non-violent parent mm. as such. So the mum or the dad who's not the aggressor, we will talk to them and try and look at what is it that we need to do to help them get safe. So it might be that dad's coming home and he's drunk and that's when it's happening and, and dad needs help with a, an alcohol right. or a mental right. health problem. So things like that, we could probably try and put services in place. We might talk to them about um, separation between mom and dad mm. that type of thing but the child will always remain with the with the non-violent parent um it's a really tricky situation but what we have to understand is that that you know children mental health is affected so badly i mean i w- i've worked with hundreds of children and you know i have moms coming to me regularly saying oh i think i got my child's got autism or oh, i think my child's got adhd or you know the school are saying this because they're not of the right reading age and it's not because they've got a neurological condition you know, it's, it's statistically, it wouldn't be right, you know. So the issue here is that they're regressing because mm-hmm. of their experience. While they're okay. at school, they're not learning okay. because their mind is somewhere else or their brain is not in function because they're in survival mode constantly. They're not able to learn. And so over the course of a year or two years, like we talk about COVID and how children, because they haven't been in school, have almost like not at the stage they should be at. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. These children have been experiencing this possibly for years. And so they've got to seven, eight years old, but their reading age is still of a four-year-old. And people will say, well, actually, maybe because they've got an additional need, they're not getting it. Mm-hmm. We've sat down and done math with them this many times, they don't understand it. Now, if your brain is not in function, your learning part of your brain is not working because it's in survival mode, because that's what happens then those children aren't going to learn. You can sit and talk to them all day. It's not going to sink in. And I think people don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the research that's coming out. And and that's why I say it's more detrimental to the children to remain in a a home where violence or abuse is an issue than it is to take them away. Um, Because it could have lifelong consequences for that child. It's, you know, so important to continue having these conversations, isn't it? Because as much as this campaign has come out um, due to the lockdown and the fact that we've seen the, you know, increase, quite rapid increase of domestic abuse during lockdown, this conversation isn't going to go away. No. Uh, the campaign, You Are Not Alone, is to really let people know that there is information out there. If you need the help, there is help available um, but to take the first step and to know that you're not going through this alone Uh, there are a couple of organizations I would like to give the details for as well Um, and if you want to speak to anyone perhaps a lot of what Sadish has said right now resonates with you um, or you're thinking about someone that you know and you want to give them the details then you can go um to a number of different websites. The organizations that are available include Karma Nirvana, Roshni, Saheli, and the Sharon Project. Um, you can also go to refuge.org.uk where they have outlined uh, different organizations and different ways that you can get help. There is a 24-hour free national domestic abuse helpline where they also provide support for language. So if you speak in Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi, then they can have an interpreter who can speak to you or your loved one. And their contact number is 0808 2000 247. So it's 0808 2247. And for Swan, again, they provide a 24 hour um, helpline as well with interpreters. Their number is 0800 953 9777. Just finally, Sadish, if you want to talk to the camera rather than talking to me and you could speak to someone who's going through this, what is the one thing that you want to say to them? 
just give us a call. We're happy to talk to you. You know, our staff are experienced. They've done this for a long time. You don't have to give your name. Um, you know, we, we don't have to give us any other details. Just talk to us and we will talk to you uh, and talk you through your options. Um, and nobody will ever, ever force you to do anything against your will. Domestic abuse takes away your control and we would never do that to you. So please, please, please reach out and ask for help if you need it. Sadish, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I feel, especially for this particular podcast, if uh, there's someone that you know um, who you think will need to see this, pass this on to them um, and share this. It's just two more websites that I'd like to give you the details for. One is womensaid.org.uk and the other is mankind.org.uk. They also provide a lot of support to both men, to women and their families uh, if you are going through and facing domestic abuse. Um, as ever, thank you so much for watching the Brit Asia podcast special with Sunny and Shay.